Ladies and gentlemen, we're about to get started. If you could take your seats. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for being here today. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Dr. Daniel Stewart, and for those of you that do know me, I'm Dan. Uh, I am from the History and Humanities Department here at Fayetteville Tech, and it's my honor to wel welcome you here today for the first installment of the Fall 2023 Community History Lecture Series. Today's lecture is, like many of them, in partnership with the Lafayette Society of Fayetteville, and before I introduce today's guest speaker, I'd like to invite our friend Gwen Melton of La the Lafayette Society to come up and share a few words, and then we will get to meet Dr. Lloyd Kramer. Uh, thank you, everyone. Oh, I see some friends. Yay! Hey! Oh, lots of friends. So, let me get back to what I'm supposed to be doing. Uh, so I am representing the Lafayette Society. I am currently a board member who's been on for far too long and the secretary. I am happy to let you know that we have been extremely pleased with making absolutely certain that everyone in this state and beyond knows what the Lafayette Society stands for. Society implies a hoity-toity historical organization. That is not what this is. This is a very modern, updated organization that is trying to educate everyone about all the legacy that Lafayette has to present. In doing so, we absolutely always, always, fabulously celebrate his birthday, which is this weekend. And with that, we are pleased to have just had a concert done by Dr. Gail Morfessis and her friends. We will be learning why our city is called Lafayette by the esteemed Dr. Kramer. We will have a lecture this evening at Methodist College with Dr. Mize talking about Lafayette and its relationship to Native Americans. And there will be an ability to actually see a beautiful collection what we would call arrowheads, uh, they're called something else. We are going to follow that tomorrow with a birthday celebration. Cupcakes will be given to those who are greedy enough to partake of them. We also will have a trolley ride where you will see exactly where the marquee visited here in Fayetteville, North Carolina. To end this amazing weekend, there will be a Lafayette ball and soiree done by Bes Bespoken Vintage with Rebecca Russell, and some of us will be adorned in Regency era costume. I hope that you enjoyed this lecture and all that we have to offer here in Fayetteville for the Marquis de Lafayette's birthday. Thank you, Gwen. And now I'd like to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Lloyd Kramer. Dr. Kramer is a professor of history at UNC. He's director of the Carolina Public Humanities Program and author of several books to include Lafayette and Two Worlds, copies of which are on sale here today. And I believe you'll be doing book signings at after? Okay. All right. I believe correctly. A after the presentation, if you'd like to purchase a book and get it signed, now's your chance. Uh, let's give Lloyd a big, warm Fayetteville welcome. Thank you, everybody. I'm so happy to be here. I want to thank Dan for inviting me. I want to thank Gwen for her warm welcome. I want to thank the Lafayette Society for all they do here. And I want to say that I think Fayetteville is one of the great cities in America, in part because it's named Fayetteville. And you had nothing to do with that, but you all live here. So thank you. I'm glad to be here. And I 
I want to share some ideas today, and then I hope we'll be able to have a little discussion about this. Um, because I, I've given this title, Why is Our City Called Fayetteville? Because I, I assume there are people who actually live here who don't know why the city is named Fayetteville. They just say, I live in Fayetteville. And I think the, the way to understand this is that Lafayette became the most popular foreigner in America in the 19th century, and he may be the most popular foreigner ever in American history. And in any case, very few foreigners have ever become so popular or so successful. And that's what I want to talk about today. Why was he so popular? And the other side of the question then is, why is Fayetteville named for Lafayette? And it has to do with his popularity. Um, not only are we in Fayetteville, we're at Fayetteville Tech uh, College, we, uh, Community College. There is a Lafayette Society. How many communities are so marked by Lafayette, or even more specifically, by someone who lived in the 18th century? And how many 18th century foreigners have so many towns and counties named for them? I don't think you would find very many. So these are the kind of questions I want to explore today. Why Fayetteville? Why Lafayette? And why was he so popular? And I want to suggest that he was popular because somehow he contributed to America's early national identity. This is why he was honored, because he helped Americans understand who they were and who they wanted to be, especially who they wanted to be. Uh, I would say that Lafayette has never been as popular in France as he is in the United States. In fact, many people in France don't much like him because of what happened during the French Revolution. He managed to alienate both the conservatives and the radicals, and therefore he came down in the middle somewhere. And that's a very dangerous place to be in highly polarized times, as he caught, as he caught up in the French Revolution. But I want to focus today not on what happened to him in France, but what happened to him in the United States. And I want to try to understand the reasons for his unique historical reputation. And Lafayette is most remembered in the United States because of his role in the American Revolution, his friendship with the founding fathers, people like George Washington, of course, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, but he also had another great achievement. He came back to America in 1824 and made a tour in which he visited every state in the country, every state that was then a state, in 1824-25. And that visit included the town of Fayetteville. I, uh, I have here a coveted map of the entire tour, and I'm not, I'm gonna show a couple of images from this, but um, this shows everywhere he went, and if you wanna look at it afterwards, you can come and study this map. I love this map. I, I won't say I look at it every day, but I look at it from time to time. And there's going to be, there's gonna be a great celebration of this tour in Fayetteville, in 18 and 2025. Where are we? You're telling about a dance? I'm stuck in 1825. So um, that's going to even go beyond cupcakes, as I understand it. So, um, so I want to focus especially on the meaning of this great tour, this great tour that he took in 1824 25. This is a map that shows every place that Lafayette went. The part that's marked in green shows where he went in 1824. The part marked in blue shows where he went in 1825. And everywhere he went, he was hailed by great crowds. He was like a great rock star. He was like, in, in my age, you know, some of you probably lived in my age, like when the Beatles came to, do you remember when the Beatles came to America? I would say Lafayette was the Beatles of his era. 
Everybody wanted to see him. They came out. There were huge crowds. They said, Lafayette's coming. Um, he was greeted by uh, bands, by parades, by military units that came out to greet him. And this is the key to his enduring fame is that tour. And a lot of people named their children for Lafayette. I bet somebody in this room has somebody in their family named for Lafayette. I actually discovered this. There was someone named Samuel Lafayette Jones in my family, and I, I oh my gosh, <laughs> I have a Lafayette connection. Well, he was just born, you know. A lot of babies were born after Lafayette. People were in a celebratory mood. I, <laughs> and they named their kids for Lafayette. This is a map here. I can actually move her. I've got a mic. See, I, it's like a rock. I'm like a beetle right here. I'm gonna, um, you see, he came down from the area around Washington. He came through Virginia. He went to Raleigh, and he came to Fayetteville. And this map, this is a version of what I just held up on this map. This shows the towns where he visited. So the question is, why did people celebrate this man who was called the hero of two worlds? What made him so popular? That's what I want to try to understand. This is a, an image of Fayetteville's buildings around 1825. I assume some of you have seen this image. There's a picture of Lafayette way up in the corner there. These are some of the buildings in the town. And when he came to places like Fayetteville, it was also a great opportunity for merchants. They sold souvenirs. See, it's like a rock tour, you know, farewell tour. Lafayette gloves. They had songs about Lafayette. They had souvenir pictures. They had, I mean, I don't know if anybody has gloves of Lafayette. Does anybody have a glove that has Lafayette's picture? I think these have kind of dropped out of style. For this dance tomorrow, if you could show up with Lafayette gloves, you would knock the whole crowd right off their feet. <laughs> Unfortunately, I do not have Lafayette gloves, but I've seen a lot of pictures of them. Here they are. So there's something else about Lafayette that's fascinating. He had a great impact on American national identity without ever writing a book about America. You know, Alexis de Tocqueville wrote Democracy in America, 1830s. 1835, 1840. Lafayette also told the story of America. But unlike Tocqueville, who wrote that very influential and popular book, Lafayette told the story of, La of America in each town he went to. So in fact, Lafayette's story of America reached more people than Tocqueville's story of America because so many people who never read a book or cared about reading a book went and heard him give a little talk, even in Fayetteville, but in all these other towns that he went to. So what he did everywhere was evoke the memory of the American Revolution and the importance of American history. And he seemed almost like a magical appearance from another era. In 1825, that was 50 years since the beginning of the American Revolution. Think back to your 50th class reunion, if you've had one. How far back in history all of the other generals of the Continental Army were deceased. And of course, George Washington was deceased. Uh, Thomas Jefferson was still alive. He, it was like a miracle. Here comes a man from the distant past. So in order to understand why people embraced him, you have to understand a little about that history of the American Revolution. I'm going to come back to the tour. We're going to get back on the, on the bandwagon, so to speak. But first, let's look at his story. I think um, the themes of his life actually emerged in the 1770s. And there was a long-term continuity in Lafayette's life. Um, and the amazing thing about Lafayette as a foreigner was that he knew how to interact with Americans. And he was, he was from a, a noble family, but he was very down to earth. He was someone that people felt they could talk with, they could communicate with. And I think that was part of his genius. Um, he was born in the central part of France in a town called Chavignac. I know we have a lot of uh, Lafayette experts in the room. Um, 
He grew up there, uh, but his father was killed when he was two years old. His father was killed in a battle against the British during the Seven, uh, seven Years' War on the continent of Europe, and his mother died when he was 12. So by the age he was of 12, he had no uh, living parents. He was raised by uh, aunts and uncles and uh, grandparents, a grandmother, and he ended up in Paris with family members, and at age 16, he married this woman, Adrienne de Noailles, who was only 14 years old. I mean, people got married fairly young at that time. And it was an arranged marriage, and the family wanted um, to marry Lafayette, wanted their daughter to marry Lafayette, because he had a very large income. His mother's lands, his father's lands, they accounted for something like 130,000 livres of income per year. I, I can't put that in exactly in contemporary dollars. It was a lot of money because most workers would be lucky to make one or two livres a day. So if you had an income in that range, you were extremely wealthy. And the family, the Duc de Noailles, said, well, you know, he's a young man, but I think he'll do well with our daughter, Adrienne. It wasn't about love, it was about money. So money can buy you love. <laughs> We're back to the Beatles, I'm sorry. but <laughs> It bought him a little love. But actually, they fell in love. They really loved each other. And Adrienne was an important influence in his life. But because of this Noai family connection, he was given a position in the Noai family regiment in eastern France, near the city of Metz. But he became very restless. He was 18, 19 years old. He was a teenager. You know how teenagers, they get restless. And he was bored. There was not much going on. He heard from an English um, member of the elite, the Duke of Gloucester, about this revolution in America. He got very interested in it. And he um, went to Paris and secretly volunteered to join the American army with a man named Silas Dean, who was the American representative before Benjamin Franklin became the American representative. And Silas Dean wrote a letter and said, this man will be very useful. And he, he said, you should, you should join the army. But the French government did not give him permission to leave. So Lafayette secretly went down near Bordeaux to an area called Saint-Jean-de-Luz. He bought his own ship. How many of us would buy their own ship <laughs> called the Victoire? and sailed to America secretly on his own boat with about 15 or 16 other Frenchmen who went with him. He arrived in um, Charleston, South Carolina. This was in the summer of 1777, around June. He went north to Philadelphia. He arrived at the Continental Congress and said, I'm here to be a commander in the army. And he said, who, a 19-year-old boy from France? Who sent you here? <laughs> He said, I have this letter. Oh my God, Silas Dean, he gives these letters to everybody. But somebody told George Washington, this guy's from a family that could help us. And other people, including Benjamin Franklin, said this guy could be useful. And so they decided to make him a general at age 19 in the Continental Army on the condition he would get no pay and have no soldiers. <laughs> nice job if you can get it. So that was how he got started. But here he is with George Washington. From the very beginning, Washington got interested in young Lafayette. We know Washington had no children of his own. He had no son, for example. We know Lafayette had no father. His father had died when he was only two years old. And lots of historians have talked about this as a kind of father-son attachment. They really bonded. And Washington quickly became very interested in Lafayette, and Lafayette greatly admired George Washington. This is a portrait by uh, Charles Wilson Peale of Washington and Lafayette. And Lafayette began writing letters to Washington. This is after he joined the army in October of 1777. And he convinced Washington that he would listen to whatever Washington told him. This is a letter he wrote. I shall, his spelling wasn't too good, but he was already learning English. I shall conduct myself entirely by your advices, and if you say something is proper, I'll do it directly. I desire only to know your opinion. 
How many fathers would like their 19-year-old sons to say that to them? Hey, son, what would you like? Dad, you just tell me what to do. It caught Washington's attention because there were lots of other Frenchmen coming to America, but their first uh, encounter with Washington was, uh, General Washington, this is what I think you should do. You need more troops here. You need to send an army there. You, and, and Washington said, thank you very much. I don't need people coming from Europe to tell me what to do. And Lafayette says, just tell me what to do. Says, Come on in, son. That's the kind of man we need on this team. So I'm not going to go through Lafayette's career. He got involved in the Battle of Brandywine, where he was actually wounded. Uh, Washington sent him into northern Pennsylvania to be healed in a Moravian community. He later was in the Battle of Barron, um, Barron Hill. He was in a number of activities around New Jersey. He went back to France and helped to arrange for the General Rochambeau to bring an army in 1780. But Lafayette's most important contribution came in the campaign of 1781 when he was sent to Virginia by George Washington to try to capture Benedict Arnold. Remember Benedict Arnold, the traitor? Um, there has to be a villain in this story. We'll bring Benedict Arnold in. And Lafayette chased Benedict Arnold around Virginia, never quite caught him, but Benedict Arnold never caught Lafayette. Cornwallis came into Virginia from North Carolina, as you know. Lafayette maneuvered, pushed him toward the coast, never engaged him directly in battle, but with brilliant guerrilla tactics, pushed Cornwallis toward the coast, sent word to Washington and Rochambeau, we have him moving toward the coast. The French Navy came and blocked the exit at Yorktown. The main American and French armies came and the great battle of Yorktown led to the American victory, independence. Lafayette played a key role in that campaign. That was his most important military contribution. This is a picture of Lafayette painted later. It's a, it's a totally unrealistic picture, but he's shown here with James Armistead. Armistead was an enslaved man in Virginia who worked as a spy for Lafayette. He went into the British forces reported on where they were going, came back and told Lafayette. He was an enslaved man. And when Lafayette came back on another trip in 1784, he learned that Armistead was trying to get his, end of his freedom. And he intervened and helped Armistead gain his freedom in 1784-85. And Armistead eventually took Lafayette as one of his names. This is a, a portrait of Lafayette and Armistead in Virginia. And the other portrait there is the surrender ceremony where General Cornwallis refused to come out of his house. But Lafayette's in the picture. So I want to just summarize why was Lafayette so successful as a foreigner in the American Revolution? What made him different from all of these other French generals? There were Polish generals. There were people from uh, Germany. I want to suggest there were three main things. First of all, he was a good listener. I mentioned this already. He had an unpretentious personal style. Just to give you one example, he never complained about the food or the drink. And virtually every other Frenchman said in their letter, the food here is horrible, and they drink this dreadful grog. You know what grog was kind of rum and water and people got drunk drinking it, got groggy. You know, we still get groggy, right? And he's, but he never complained. He, he did not criticize the food. And this style made people admire him. This is a letter Washington wrote to Governor Morris, 1778. I do most devoutly wish that we had not a single foreigner among us except the Marquis de Lafayette, who acts upon very different principles than those which govern the rest, right? He's not out just to get his own advances. He's not out to complain that I'm not a good leader. He listens. He is respectful. That's number one characteristic. Number two, he was a very effective mediator. He sent letters back to France. He encouraged the French to send more money, more arms, to send a, a, an army. And whatever happened, he, did, he looked on the bright side. This is a letter he sent to his wife, 
In early 1781, when things were going very badly for the Americans, there had in fact been a mutiny. And many people in France were saying, the Americans are not going to keep fighting. And he wrote back, no European army would suffer a tenth part of what these troops have, because one must have citizens, that is, people who believe in the cause, must have citizens to endure the nakedness, hunger, labors, and complete lack of pay that make up the lot of our soldiers the most hardened and the most patient in the world. What an affirming statement, because he sent this to his wife, but of course she circulated it among all of the elite, among government officials. They said, don't worry if you hear things are going badly. Lafayette says, these soldiers are here to stay. They're not going to abandon the cause. Second thing, so he mediated. And then the third thing, wherever he went, he told the Americans that their cause, the struggle for independence and human rights, was the most important cause in the world. And who wouldn't like that? If somebody tells you, you know what you're doing is world historically significant. Hmm, sounds good. Especially if you are from a very insecure community, no status in the world, no history to speak of, and here someone comes from an elite French family and says, you know, Europe could learn from what you're doing. Wow, that is pretty amazing that he is telling them that. So he says, this is Timothy de Matlack, who was the president of the American Philosophical Society to which Lafayette was elected in 1781. And he said, America's cause reflects the progress of philosophy and promotes the rights of mankind on a more liberal basis than anywhere else in the world. No wonder the Americans loved him. He was telling them, you are doing something that is making a huge difference in the world. So just to summarize, his personal style, the listener, his mediation between Americans and French, his affirmation of the importance of America's revolution made him the most popular foreigner in the American Revolution. And it's not an accident that when he came back in 1784, the town of Fayetteville had just been named Fayetteville. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. OK. So after the American Revolution, Lafayette went back to France. He became active in supporting the cause of human rights. He joined an anti-slavery group called the Society for the Friends of Blacks. He himself tried an experiment to take a, a plantation of, of, um, where there were enslaved workers in Guyana. His plan was to train these workers so they could be independent laborers. But then the French Revolution came and all his land was confiscated and the experiment failed. And Lafayette himself, as I'll say in a minute, ended up in prison. He also advocated for the rights of Protestants, who did not yet have equal rights in the 1780s. And when the French Revolution began, he introduced the first Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen. It basically said all uh, human beings are equal. All human beings should have equal citizenship rights and all human beings should be entitled to participate in public life in the same way. Of course, at that time, women were excluded, but that was the theory, equal human rights. This is a picture of Lafayette um, with the king, Louis XVI. This is, you can see Louis XVI still has his head and everything at this point. He's standing there with the Declaration of the Rights of Man, and Lafayette was the most popular leader of the French Revolution in the summer of 1790. And the July 14th celebration, Lafayette and the King were uh, hailed as the representatives of the new order. He was the symbol of freedom, the symbol of a new kind of regime. Here is a cartoon showing him leading the nation toward freedom. This is on the left. On the right, it's another image. There were lots of uh, artistic images of Lafayette showing him as leading the country toward a freer society. 
But by 1792, Lafayette had a complete falling out with the radical leaders of the revolution. And this is because he did not support the removal of the king. He wanted to have a constitutional monarchy rather than a republic. Because he said in France, although he supported the uh, American Republic, he said in France there is a tradition of having a monarchy and we need a, an assembly, we need elected officials, but we need to have a king who would be the symbolic uh, leader of the country. That position was highly unpopular by 1792. He was involved in some conflicts, including a violent attack on uh, protesters. He was the head of the National Guard. He was blamed for the killing of some 30 demonstrators at a, a, an anti-monarchical demonstration in 1792. And by August, he was denounced by the radical Jacobins. He fled from France. He was captured by the Austrian army. He was sent to a prison in Austria and then in Prussia, a prison at Olmutz. And for five years, he lived in solitary confinement in a prison, which was terrible. But it was good for him because if he had stayed in France, he would undoubtedly have been executed by 1793. So this is a picture on the left side of Lafayette in prison because his wife, Adrienne, and his two daughters actually managed to get there by 1795 and join him in the prison. And it affected Adrienne's health. She never fully recovered from that. Their son, who was named George Washington Lafayette, Nice name, that. He was sent to America, and he lived out the French Revolution at Mount Vernon, living in George Washington's house. So he was not in the prison. But in 1797, uh, Napoleon had defeated the Austrians in battle, and as part of the peace negotiations, he negotiated Lafayette's release from prison. Lafayette went back to uh, France. And this picture on the side here is Lagrange. This was an estate that belonged to his wife's family, the Noai, and he moved in there and he lived in that house the rest of his life until he died in 1834, although Adrienne died in 1807. And hundreds of Americans went to visit him there between the early 1800s and the 1830s. So this is a situation. I'm coming back to the rock stars tour. Lafayette, after Napoleon's fall, Lafayette got back in politics. He was elected to the Chamber of Deputies. But in 1824, he was defeated in an election in which the liberals were pushed completely out of power in France. He had no political position. The President of the United States, James Monroe, heard about this. He wanted to send a message to Europe. We stand for democracy. He invited Lafayette to come with the support of Congress. And so in 1824, in the summer, Lafayette sailed for the United States and arrived in August 1824 in New York. This is a picture on the right side of Lafayette coming off the ship and being greeted. It was a personal, there was a personal dimension to this because Lafayette was very attached to a young woman named Frances Wright, who was often called Fanny Wright. This is a picture of Frances Wright. She loved Lafayette. She was about 40 years younger than Lafayette. That is to say, in 1824, he was about 67. She was about 27. It, it wasn't exactly an age-appropriate thing to take off as a relationship. She wanted to be his adopted daughter. He loved Francis. He insisted that she come with him on the trip. So when he arrived in America, he was accompanied by a young woman, Fanny Wright, her sister, Camille Wright. Americans couldn't quite figure out who this person was. His son, George Washington Lafayette, and a, a, a writer, a journalist named Auguste Lavasseur. Lavasseur was going to write an account of the journey to promote liberal politics in Europe. That was the personal side of the trip. The public side was this huge spectacle. Every city he went into, every city official, the governor, the wealthiest people, the poorest people, they came out to see him. They built special arches for him. 
This is a, an arch in Philadelphia. He was welcomed in the Congress in Washington, D.C., the first foreigner to address a joint session of Congress in the House of Representatives. He came to Fayetteville. I just want to, <laughs> you may think Philadelphia was important. It was. Washington, important. Fayetteville, March the 4th. We'll come back to Fayetteville. This is a portrait of Lafayette sent by an artist named Ari Scheffer in 1824 as a gift to the American people. And this became the most famous portrait of Lafayette. Many states created money with Lafayette's picture on it. Lafayette's picture hangs in the House of Representatives to this day, and it is exactly that picture. I don't know if you've ever, has anyone here been in a session of the Congress? Well, there it is. He's seen a lot. I'll come back to that as well, because I have a picture of the Congress. Um, so it was a great celebration. Just to remind you again, he came down. I want to show this this map one more time. He came across uh, southern Virginia. He came in up in Halifax, near Halifax County. He came down to Raleigh. He was greeted there. He came to Fayetteville on March the 4th. And he only stayed here about 24 hours. But for many people in Fayetteville, it was the most important event that had ever happened in the city. It may still be. No, I wouldn't say that, I'm sure. <laughs> A lot of important things have happened since 1825, but it was huge. So here's an account of Lafayette's arrival in Fayetteville in 1825 by this writer, Auguste Levasseur, who was with him on the trip. He was sending articles back to the French press. He said, on March the 4th, we arrived in the pretty little city of Fayetteville. Hmm. The weather was dreadful. The rain fell in torrents, and yet several miles before the city, the road was covered with men and children on horseback. The streets were covered with a crowd of ladies dressed in all their finery who were so seized by the pleasure of gazing on him that they didn't even appear to notice the deluge that was destined to engulf them. They wore their beautiful clothes out for the ball and got soaked. Never mind. There he is. This enthusiasm is understood when one considers that it was manifested by the inhabitants of a city founded 40 years ago to perpetuate the memory of the very person whom they were honoring on this day. So then Lafayette listened to the speech of the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, J Justice Toomer, who spoke on the behalf of the City Council. And this is what this Justice Toomer said. And this was what was said at every town Lafayette visited, in one version or another. In his speech, the orator recapitulated enthusiastically the obligations that America had to Lafayette, recalled the persecutions to which he was exposed in France and in Austria, the imprisonment, for being faithful to the principles of liberty and the rights of man, and ended by setting up a comparison between the United States and the old European continent. Bingo, you see? America versus Europe. America stands for freedom. Lafayette stands for freedom. The Europeans threw him in prison. The contrast is striking. So in the evening in Fayetteville, they had a ball. They had special music. These are some other things. These are banquet menus. I don't know if you can read. Um, this was a typical menu. of When Lafayette came to Fayetteville, they had a great dinner. Um, this is a dinner in Boston. It's fish. You can see, look at all that food. I don't know how Lafayette stood up after that. <laughs> and then after all of this food, they would have toast, and they always had at least 13 drinks to honor the original 13 colonies. <laughs> and everybody went home, more or less, um, in a good mood. And, but Lafayette was a wise man. He didn't drink too much. He kind of faked it. You know, I read stories about this. And then there were temperance groups that said, oh, Lafayette is our hero. He just drinks water. Well, if he had 13 drinks every night, that would have been the end of the tour. <laughs> but I wanted to show you the menu. I don't know what they serve here at Lafayette Day. We have cupcakes tomorrow, right? Cupcakes. <laughs> Eat your heart out, because in Boston, it would have started with the fish dish. And I mentioned before the, um, the souvenirs, 
This is a piece of jewelry with Lafayette's picture on it. There are the Lafayette gloves again. And they sold thousands of ceramic plates showing Lafayette's arrival in New York. Um, my wife and I visited a, a friend who lived in Edenton a few years ago, and she brought out a plate of this kind that had been buried in her backyard in the 1790s. It was broken. She said, look at this. And I said, that's a Lafayette plate. <laughs> she said, I know. We found it in the backyard near the privy. There was a privy out there. Not anymore, but that's where somebody had buried it. And I said, this was the most honored dish when someone would come over to serve dinner on a Lafayette platter. OK. It was a big deal. Let me point out that Lafayette came to America in 1824, which was the most polarized moment in American history up to that point, except perhaps in the Jefferson Adams election of 1800. You may remember that John Quincy Adams was running for president against Andrew Jackson. We know about polarization right now in 2023. America was, I would say, equally polarized in 1824. Each side believed that if the other side got into power, the America they cared about would be destroyed. The people who supported Jackson, mostly in the South and the rural areas, believed that John Quincy Adams was a Yankee who was hostile to the South. People in New England and the Northeast believed Andrew Jackson was uh, out to destroy the values of, of New England. The election ended without a winner. It went to the House of Representatives. Jackson actually won more of the popular vote, but in the House of Representatives, it was thrown to John Quincy Adams. Can you imagine how angry the Jackson supporters were? We can imagine that in the age of election denialism and conflict in our own time. Amazingly, wherever Lafayette went, the people who supported Jackson and the people who supported Adams, they all loved Lafayette. The only thing anybody could agree on was, this is the greatest man who ever came to America. And they would all be screaming, oh yes, but here's Lafayette. Let's have another drink for Lafayette. That was an amazing contribution he made to challenge the polarization of that time. And there was a great deal of anxiety among Americans that the American experiment, that American democracy was going to collapse. Because the founding fathers had all mostly died off, there was intense sectional conflict. America's status in the world was very problematic. There was a growing debate about slavery and the struggle for uh, emancipation. How is America going to survive that? And wherever Lafayette went, he gave a speech, just like in Fayetteville. This particular uh, speech, this is Lafayette's speech in Philadelphia. Can anyone read that speech? I don't think so. This is not an eye exam, by the way. but. That was typical. If you had gone to Philadelphia, they were selling souvenir handkerchiefs. I don't know who would blow their nose on Lafayette's speech, but there it is. <laughs> and everywhere he went, he gave his speech at Independence Hall in Philadelphia. He made three points that were absolutely central to American nationalism in 1824-25, and I would argue they have remained the fundamental themes of American national identity down to the 21st century. First, the American Revolution is the most uniquely successful revolution in world history. Other revolutions created problems, fell into chaos, created guillotines, it kind of downplayed the conflict in some ways. The American Revolution led to a successful outcome. And that outcome, secondly, was the creation of a constitution and democratic institutions. And thirdly, the success of those institutions can be seen in the incredible economic development of the United States since the 18th century. And he said, you may not know this, but I was here in 1775, 1777, and I can tell you this country has been transformed Look how much money you have. Americans loved that. You have shown what prosperity looks like. So here's the speech. You probably couldn't read it on the handkerchief, but let me just give you this excerpt. These are the three themes, uniqueness of the American Revolution, success of political institutions, 
economic prosperity. Within these sacred walls, Independence Hall in Philadelphia, was boldly declared the independence of these vast United States, which has begun for the civilized world the era of a new and of the only true social order founded on the unedible rights of man, the practicality and advantages of which are every day admirably demonstrated by the happiness and prosperity of your city, right? There's the institutions, successful. The sign of that, prosperity. Here was planned the formation of our virtuous, brave, and revolutionary army, and the providential inspiration received that gave the command to our beloved, matchless Washington. But these and many other remembrances are mingled with a deep regret for the great and good men whose loss we have remained to mourn. It is to their services that I refer the greatest part of the honors here and elsewhere received much superior to my individual merit. You see the humility? Hey, I was just one of the team. And this revolution had the greatest revolutionary army. We had the great leader. This is American nationalism affirmed by a French visitor. You see why they loved him. They said, he's the greatest man in the world. And if someone said you were the greatest country or the greatest person, you might think this is a really amazing person. But I want to stress that Lafayette also issued some warnings. Wherever he went, he talked about the dangers of sectional conflict. He didn't you know, name Jackson or Adams. He said this country can only survive by affirming its democratic institutions. He also, very subtly, because he had to be diplomatic, but he tried to show that he was in some way a, a harsh critic of, of slavery. Now, I, I've said in, in France he had joined uh, associations to oppose slavery. Um, this is an image that was published in France, Lafayette en Amérique, showing African Americans greeting Lafayette as a symbol of um, someone who opposes slavery and stands for human rights. In New York, he visited the African American School for Young uh, Students. Uh, he embraced the students at this school. He went to New Orleans and embraced the black soldiers in New Orleans. There were black veterans who had served in the uh, army. In Virginia, he specifically asked to visit the family of an enslaved, um, of an enslaved family at a place where he visited because he knew there were formerly in the soldiers, there were African Americans like Armistead who had been part of the revolutionary movement. And in Georgia, where they said no enslaved person could come to the parade to meet Lafayette, he explicitly asked to go and meet an older enslaved man near Savannah who had been also part of the revolutionary effort. I just want to point that out because there were some people who were disappointed in Lafayette's critique of slavery, but he, he found ways to show this is America's great flaw. Uh, he also supported his friend, remember Francis Wright. While Francis Wright was in America in 1824-25, she became so angry about the slave system that she started a project over in Tennessee near Memphis, a town, a city called Neshoba, or a farm. This is Neshoba on the right side, where it was kind of like what Lafayette had tried to do in Guyana but failed. She began, a, you know, you had to buy enslaved people. That's, that's the way it worked. She raised money and brought these enslaved people to this farm and freed them and then began teaching, you know, helping them learn uh, new skills, carpentry or brick bricklaying. And her goal was to create an autonomous community of, uh, of free black workers. Uh, the, the project became very controversial. The critics said, oh, look, they're promoting mixed race marriage. There's all kinds of things. Eventually, the project collapsed. She moved 30 of the formerly enslaved workers to Haiti. And so there is a link between Nashoba and Haiti, which had gained its independence from France in 1804. Lafayette wrote his friends, Thomas Jefferson, James Monroe, James Madison. He said, you should send money to Francis Wright. 
they didn't want to do that. But I just point that out, that was also part of the trip. So what does all this mean? Lafayette became a hero to American national pride, American national identity, and this continued even after his death, which took place on May the 20th, 1834. There was a great celebration of his life in the House of Representatives. John Quincy Adams gave a two-hour speech about how Lafayette was the greatest man in modern history. And he was buried in Picpou Cemetery. Has anyone ever been to Picpou Cemetery? We've got a, a few Lafayette fans here. He was buried with, under some soil he took home from Virginia on his tour. This is his grave, and an American flag has flown over his grave ever since the 19th century. In fact, during the Nazi occupation of Paris, there was only one place in France where the American flag was still flying, and it was on Lafayette's grave in the Picpou Cemetery in the 12th arrondissement in Paris. And it's still there. You can go and visit that cemetery. And when the Americans went into the war, and the famously uh, General John Pershing went to the grave and they said, Lafayette, we are here. It wasn't actually Pershing who said it, it was his aide de camp, uh, Colonel Stanton, but they all said it was Pershing because it made a great story. <laughs> so because of what Lafayette did, and especially his ability to affirm the meaning of American identity, one of his carriage drivers was taking him through a street in Connecticut and he said, get out of the way, I am bringing the greatest man in the world through town. That's what they called him, the greatest man in the world. And here is an art, a piece of art from 1825 showing him on the Brandywine going back to France, imagining him communing with the deceased founding fathers, Washington and Franklin, about what has happened to the country you created 50 years ago. And this is why Fayetteville was named for Lafayette. In 1783, there were these two towns, Campbellton and Cross Creek. There was a desire to merge them. I'm sure you all know this story better than I do because I'm just a visitor and you all live here. Maybe you repeat this history to your children and your grandchildren. <laughs> Cross Creek, Campbellton. So they decided, what are we gonna call the town? And in 1783, they said, let's name it for Lafayette, the first town in America named for Lafayette. And that's why he came here in 1825. And so even today, as you walk across your town, there are reminders not only of the name of the city, there's this great statue, the sculpture by Ferenc Varga from I think 1983 in Cross Creek Park. There's the statue that has a little narrative about his life. And just in 2021, the Lafayette Trail uh, Project put up this marker. I was honored to be able to visit on that day. It was a, the pandemic. A lot of us, we were still wearing our masks. It was, a, it was a gloomy day in the world, but a beautiful day in Fayetteville. I don't know, how many of you were there when that monument went up? Four, well, it was a special day. And you can still see this marker. On March the 4th, 1825, General Lafayette was welcomed at Town House, one block south. Fayetteville was renamed in his honor in 1783. When your family come to visit you, take a walk through that park and show them those markers. And to conclude, I just wanna note how many other towns and counties in America were named for Lafayette. And they were named for Lafayette because more than any other foreigner in American history, he helped Americans understand who they were and affirm the narrative, I'll call it the nationalist narrative, they were constructing for their own identity. In other words, identities always depend on the affirmation of others. That's true in our personal lives as well as our public lives. Lafayette affirmed the identity of America as Americans envisioned themselves. He therefore became a hero. Here are some of the places, Alabama, Arkansas, Lafayette County, California, uh, Lafayette, 
Colorado, Lafayette, Florida, Lafayette County. By the way, Lafayette County was where he was given 10,000 acres of land when he came in 1824 because they never paid him during the revolution. And they said, would you like some money? And he said, well, I don't need it, but I wouldn't hurt. And they said, here's, here's 10,000 acres of land which he sold to have a more pleasant retirement. You can still see it, Lafayette County. Georgia, Fayette County, Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Fayette County, Fayette, Fayette County, Kentucky, Louisiana, Lafayette Parish, Lafayette, Louisiana, Maine, Minnesota, Mississippi, Missouri, Lafayette County, Lafayette County, New Hampshire, Mount Lafayette in the mountains, New Jersey, Lafayette, New Jersey, New York, LaGrange, that was his house, a lot of LaGranges around, North Carolina, Cumberland County, Fayetteville, there's also Lenore County, LaGrange. Ohio, Oregon, Pennsylvania, Lafayette College, which was founded two years after his visit and named for him. By the way, Duke's playing Lafayette this week. <laughs> you may see the score and people will see it as a football game. You will say, I know why it's called Lafayette College. It has to do with his affirmation of American identity in 1824. You should bring that up, like on Saturday when people are talking about football over dinner, you should say, you know, it's really interesting football today. Did you happen to notice that Duke Lafayette score? And people will say, what was it? And I said, Lafayette, let me just tell you a few things about Lafayette. <laughs> I'll tell you, your dinner party will bring the house down. Anyway, Duke Lafayette, I'm more a Carolina guy myself, but I'm strongly for Lafayette College. Texas, Fayette County. West Virginia, Fayette County. Wisconsin, Lafayette County. All right, let me just end with this portrait. Not only were all these towns named for Lafayette, this portrait, which I described, stands right here. Every time, every time I watch some event going on in the Congress, other people may be, this is a State of the Union address, I think a few years ago when George Bush was speaking. You see over here, you see that portrait? Lafayette. Since 1825, Lafayette has watched everything that happened in that room. The conflicts, the passage of new laws, the, the amendment to give women the right to vote, the, um, all of the conflicts, the impeachment, the, the uh, January 6th, Lafayette was, oh my God, he was watching. I mean, I, I like to Lafayette's like, my God, I warned you about this kind of thing. <laughs> Lafayette is there. And, of course, he's also in Lafayette Square, the main park across from the White House. So you cannot go to Washington, D.C. without encountering Lafayette. But most importantly, you cannot come to Fayetteville, North Carolina, without engaging with the story of Lafayette. Lafayette, we are here. Okay, that's it. So Dan said we can have questions, comments. You don't need any responses, any thoughts. I'm happy to entertain anything. Do you want to circulate with the microphone? Or that was that? Um, just because we're streaming this, I believe, and we need to be able to make sure that people can hear it. Test. Can you tell us a little bit about his trip to Raleigh before he went there before Fayetteville. Do you know? Can you That's right. He went to Raleigh just a couple of days on the same trip, obviously. He was greeted there by the governor and by the leaders of the political community. I don't know all the details of that. I know they've recently put up a they put up a marker there as well. Um, in some ways, I think that was a, that was an important political event for the state, but I actually think the celebration in Fayetteville was a bigger party. There's a plaque, it was near where Shaw University is now. If you go to Raleigh, you can see where, that, where he was greeted, and it was very much the same kind of event. The governor and various dignitaries gave speeches like Justice Toomer did in Fayetteville. Lafayette responded, and he always gave basically the same speech that I read from Philadelphia, except he didn't say in this building. But what he sh told people everywhere was that the America had showed, shown the rest of the world what democracy and freedom could look like. Despite the limitations, as I said, he was, no he was never sympathetic to slavery, 
but he insisted that American values were valuable to Europe. Yes. Uh, Lloyd, I may be accused of having a dirty mind, but when Fanny Wright accompanied him in the early part of his tour, there must have caused some dissension amongst his family, I would think. So let's, let's get behind the, the headlines here. <laughs> so Fanny, I, I, you know, the word Fanny has kind of a different meaning in our society. I, I think we'll call her Frances. She was an orphan. Her parents died early. She was originally from Scotland. She was actually born on Lafayette's birthday in 1797. So this is Fanny Wright's birthday. We could throw out a cupcake for Fanny. <laughs> she came to America and as a young woman, like she was 20, like Lafayette, took a tour, went home to Scotland and wrote a book about her trip. She went to France because she wanted to find someone to translate the book into French. And so she went to Lafayette, and Lafayette was smitten by young Fanny Wright, who was probably 23 years old. And she basically moved into Lagrange, and other members of the family, you're right, they were like, um, Dad, <laughs> why is this young woman here? You know, his daughters were there, Virginia and so forth. And he said, well, she's, she's very interested in America. Mm-hmm, yeah. <laughs> and they spent a lot of time in the study looking at letters about America. So yes, the family was very upset. And then, realizing that they weren't exactly going to become lovers, but she proposed that he adopt her that she become his adopted daughter. Needless to say, the biological daughters of Lafayette did not support this proposal that she would become his legal daughter. And they were very uncomfortable with that. And yet, when he was invited by James Monroe to come to America, he had such an emotional crisis at the thought of leaving Fanny, who continued to spend a lot of time in Lagrange, that he insisted she must also come to America with him. And the family was not pleased. So they finally worked out a deal for her to come on a separate ship two weeks later. She arrived in New York two weeks after Lafayette, and they intersected at many places along the, tr the trip in Philadelphia. She spent a week with Lafayette at Monticello and got in arguments with Thomas Jefferson about slavery. And Thomas Jefferson said, who is this young woman? Anyway, one last thing about Fanny. When she was in Philadelphia, she greeted and went to an event with a number of people um, from Haiti, African Haitians, and there was a great scandal that Fanny, as a white woman, was entertaining black men from Haiti. That's how radical, in that time, that's what that was. And Lafayette defended her. Yeah. How much formal education did he have? The language barrier between French and English <clears throat> must have been difficult for him, but yet he's writing speeches and he's writing letters. He must have had yeah. some kind of education. So Lafayette, he did not have a great education. He went to a lycée in Paris. Um, after his father died, he stayed in Chavignac. He was sort of educated by his grandmother. Um, he ended up going to a lycée in Paris, and he, his favorite readings were ancient history. He loved the stories of Plutarch. You know, Plutarch wrote the stories of great leaders in the ancient world. This was Lafayette's favorite author, and many people have said he wanted to be like the great men in Plutarch's stories. He was not highly educated. He was not an intellectual. In fact, a lot of intellectuals kind of looked down on him in France. However, when he came to America, he made a very systematic effort to learn English, unlike many of the older Frenchmen. He was only 19, so maybe that gave him, an, you know, younger people tend to learn languages more quickly. And you could see in these letters, even within a few months, he was writing all his letters in English. And this is another reason that the American commanders so admired him. He always spoke English to the other American um, military people. And on that tour, 
everywhere he went, he spoke in English. He didn't use a translator. He was not highly educated, but he learned English quite well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so he said quite a bit about politics and social issues on his visit. As a professional soldier, do you know of anything he said about the American military or his, his critique maybe of our performance in the War of 1812 or anything like that? So I, I can't speak specifically to the War of 1812, but I will say he was very influenced by American military uh, strategy. As I said, he became aware of how you could have motivated soldiers who could defeat professional soldiers. So European armies at that time, high, before the French Revolution, highly professional. You didn't have you know, common people in the army and were draftees. Um, he became convinced that the militia, the American militia, and citizen armies could be more effective than professional armies. That's why I said the American arm, the American soldiers, I, I read that one quote, he said they're put up with, with pain and misery because they believe in the cause. If they're fighting only for money, they're gone. And when the French Revolution came, he organized the National Guard in Paris as based on the idea of the militia that he had seen in, the, in America. And he always argued that citizen soldiers were better than a professional military. So that left a lasting impression on him. The other thing I would say about Lafayette he was one of the first people to realize that a guerrilla army, this is something we've seen a lot in the modern anti-colonial wars, as long as you can keep the army in the field, you are not defeated. So the key to success is to engage, but always to withdraw if you are at a disadvantage. Don't go for a frontal assault. Always maneuver, harass supply lines, choose targeted um, you know, opportunities until you can trap the army in an impossible situation, which is exactly what he did at Yorktown. And uh, many people think his, that's why I say the Virginia campaign was his greatest achievement as a commander. Yeah. Had Lafayette developed his critique of slavery during Washington's lifetime, and if so, did they have interactions about that subject? Yes, that's a very good point. In 1784, you know, I showed that picture of Washington, Lafayette saying goodbye to Lafayette. I don't know, let me just bring that picture back up here, way back here. Um, Lafayette came to visit, there he is, saying goodbye. In 1784, which was the only time he came back to America after the revolution until 1824, he went to visit George Washington. He talked to him about freeing slaves because of course Washington they had slaves at Mount Vernon. And he then wrote a letter and said, let's do this. You and I will agree that we will announce that we are going to free our enslaved. We're, I'm going to buy this plantation. He wanted Washington to collaborate with him on that project in Guyana. And Washington wrote a letter back and said, well, um, my dear friend, this is an ideal and a good idea, but America is not ready for this, and we can't, we can't do it. I can't do it. Well, uh, Lafayette went ahead and tried the experiment. He couldn't get Washington to support it. Another thing happened in 1819 at the time of the so-called Missouri Compromise. Lafayette wrote to Jefferson and said, I think it's such a shame that they're going to allow slavery to spread into Missouri. And Jefferson wrote back and said, well, I think this is a good strategy because slavery will die out on its own if it continues to spread. And Lafayette, who very much admired Jefferson, wrote back a polite letter and said, my dear friend, how does slavery die by spreading? I don't get it. And that's why when Fanny Wright came to Thomas Jefferson's house, she pushed and she started in Neshoba sort of in your face, Mr. Jefferson, there's another way forward. Yeah, I'm interested in the experiment. I guess it was in French Guyana that the experiment was. Uh, uh, why did that fail and 
How did that go? Okay, so this is a, probably one of the most controversial parts of Lafayette's life. After this attempt to set up a plan with Washington, remember Lafayette had a lot of money. He, he blew a lot of money, <laughs> but he had enough money to actually purchase a plantation with enslaved workers in Guyana, which was a French colony. And he started with exactly the plan Fanny Wright developed at Neshoba in 1825. And what happened was he was starting to do this, but in 1789, about three or four years later, the French Revolution broke out. He got totally involved in the revolution. And then he was thrown into, he fled into exile and all property of exiled noblemen was confiscated by the state and sold off to other people. He lost control of the plantation. So. The, 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 the experiment was essentially, it didn't come to fruition. Unlike Fanny Wright, who got at least 30 people to freedom in Haiti, he didn't get people out. The controversy is that when, um, and uh, Mike Duncan talks about this in his new book about Lafayette, the controversy is that when Napoleon came in, Napoleon reestablished slavery in the French Empire. Um, slavery had been abolished in 1794 by the French Revolution. Napoleon reestablished um, slavery, and then he arranged for compensation of people who had lost their lands and their enslaved workers in the, in the colonies. And he confronted Lafayette and said, you, you have to accept this, or, you, you know, he was going to, it's, it's very complicated. What happened? In the end, this is the controversy. Lafayette accepted some money from Napoleon's regime for the land and the enslaved workers who had been confiscated by the French state. He himself did not get involved in that, but there was some later compensation. That's why it's so controversial. But he was vehemently against slavery, and that's why he, he bought the, the plantation. Yeah, over here. I'm sorry. So in a day and age where members of my generation and younger often see or view men and women who lived in the late 18th, early 19th centuries as being bad for, because of the systems that were in place at that time, what else could you say about Lafayette to maybe some of the younger generation today can relate to in order to maybe not like him but at least respect him and his legacy? Um, so that's an excellent question because, of course, every human being is flawed and limited by their own context. So one of the critiques, so, so here's this question. Why would Lafayette say more about slavery when he came on this tour of 1824? Um, Lafayette was someone who believed that historical change takes place in increments. Of course, he couldn't, he couldn't know how slavery would be abolished. How, you know, none of us know what's coming next. So what Lafayette was always trying to do, and he was, like all people, unable to see where his actions might lead. What I would say to young people is, all of us live in a complicated historical context. Like Lafayette, we are confronting social injustices, we are confronting situations in which some people are in disadvantaged positions, don't have rights they should have. Let's look at this situation and think about what are the realistic steps we might consider that could move the needle forward in some way. Always knowing there's a good chance we may fail. But also, always believing, and this is why people said Lafayette was naive, always believing that the future will be better than the past or the present. Or to, uh, Lafayette didn't know this, but in the, uh, the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the great arc of history bends toward social justice. Lafayette believed that. Of course, he didn't put it that way. He believed that in the long run, there would be more democracy, more freedom, and more human rights. And he struggled to do that, even though some of his choices were failures. 
What I would say to young people is, do not give up when it looks hopeless because you never know the long-term consequences of your actions and the institutions you're trying to change. It's not easy work. You know, that. just one final point. I don't know, we're probably about ready to wrap this up. So many people in our own time, and young people are good examples of this especially, you expect instant, res you know, everything's just gonna change, you know, like, on your phone, boom, I wanna see what's the latest thing, what's cool, what's hip, what's gonna change? The long arc of history bends slowly and each generation makes some modest contribution. That's what I would say to young people. Choose what you can do and look at Lafayette as an example of someone who made mistakes but never kept trying to make the world better. I wish we could all do as well but we don't. Most of us want to be safe. Lafayette took a lot of chances, and the more chances you take, the more failures you're likely to encounter. What do you think, Dan? Are we, are we, are Any there other more questions? things? Uh, thank you very much. I love Fayetteville. Viva la Fayetteville. Um, let me um, just mention this program I direct, Carolina Public Humanities. We do seminars on history, on literature, on philosophy. We live stream these programs. If you would like to join our programs, you can go to humanities.unc.edu and we have Carolina faculty, my colleagues, giving talks on all kinds of subjects and historical problems. And um, I would love to welcome you to Chapel Hill sometime if you want to come in person. We have some people like Hank Parfit there. He's been to more than his share. <laughs> we love you, Hank. Um, if you would like any information about the program, I have a few of my brochures right here. I'm not Lafayette, but I do have some information to share. Thank you. Did you want to say something else? Just a, uh, a little commercial programming here by uh, one of your sponsors. Uh, I'm Hank Parfit with City Center Gallery and Books, and we have uh, a number of copies of Lloyd's book uh, about Lafayette, Hero in Two Worlds. And uh, I, he mentioned Michael Duncan. I certainly uh, uh, like Michael's book, but this is a whole different level. I mean, Lloyd's book, it's like his lecture today. There's good facts, there's accurate history, but gosh, it's interesting and it's fascinating. So I would encourage you to consider getting Lloyd's book. Um, when I saw it, I had read a couple books already on Lafayette. I said, I don't know, this looks like it may be too difficult for me, but no, it wasn't. It is actually, for so much history and, and so many good facts, uh, it, it explains it well. And I, I hope that some of you will take one home with you today. And I believe Lloyd will sign it for you, is that right? Well, look, I didn't come here to sign books, but I'm happy to do it. I never turned down an opportunity to sign a book. And it is, you know, it's a more uh, academic history book, but every theme I talked about in this talk is expanded on and developed in much more detail in that book. Thank you, Dan, for inviting me, and thank you for the society, Lafayette Society. Keep up the good work. Thank you, Gwen. Okay, that concludes today's lecture. Again, if you'd like to purchase a copy of Dr. Kramer's book, you can do so before leaving. I'd like to remind everyone there's another fine lecture tonight at Methodist University at 7 p.m. on Lafayette's relations with Native Americans. And there'll also be the Lafayette birthday celebration tomorrow at 1 in Cross Creek Park downtown. And finally, I'd like to also invite you all to attend the next lecture here in this series which will be on Thursday, 26 October, when guest speaker Tama Kreef, archivist of the Outer Banks History Center in Mantio, will give us a lecture on the history, folklore, and archeology span surrounding the lost colony of Roanoke Island. I hope you'll join us. Have a great day.